I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, Town Clerk Dolly McGuire, can you do roll call, please? Supervisor Clarity. Here. Councilwoman Cataldi. Present. Councilman Cahill. Here. Councilman Abbott. Here. Councilman Dean. Here. Attorney Janessi. Present. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the June 25th workshop. That was a workshop. Yes. yes. Second. Supervisor Flaherty. Aye. Councilwoman Cataldi. Aye. Councilman Cahill. Aye. Councilman Abbott. Aye. Councilman Dean. Aye. I move that we approve the minutes of July 1st, 2020 as submitted by the town clerk. Second. Second. Councilwoman Cataldi? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Abstain. Councilman Dean? Aye. And before we move on to the next order of business, a uh, little levity, I want to thank attorney, uh, town attorney Janessi for <laughs> the uh, workshop on the 25th and uh, the last uh, um, topic we discussed, because, I mean, I, I've gotten a lot of fan mail and calls, so I want to thank you, Charlie, okay? Anyway, as Patty says, I have a strange sense of humor. It proves people are watching. It does, I guess. That's a good point, yes. You know, what do they say? Uh, you know. um, but, uh, hey, you know what? It was a conversation that needed to be had. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line, so... Um, you know what? I usually see in town hall who, which of the uh, board members looked at the bills uh, week to week. Was it you, Barry? Mm -hmm. How did I miss you? I was there and you weren't. Well, that could be it. <laughs> you were at a PRC meeting. Oh, okay. All right. Well, what'd you think? Well, <laughs> I did do all the bills today, and I found them all in order, and I would move that we pay them as submitted by the finance director. Second. Councilman Dean? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilwoman Cataldi? Aye. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. And I went over the prepaid warrants as submitted by the Director of Finance, and they're all in order. I move to uh, approve those. Second. Second. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilman Dean? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilwoman Capaldi? Aye. All right. Well, hey, this is, uh, is this the first uh, resolution? Um, that overtly names you, uh, Dolly, uh, within it, as our uh, town clerk? Yes, it is. All right, your maiden voyage. Um, I'd like to make a resolution to authorize town clerk to give public notice of the availability of the town of Webster's New York State Annual Financial Report and audited financial statements, including reports for the town justices, town clerk, and receiver of taxes as filed in the town clerk's office for fiscal year ended 12-31-19. Second. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilman Dean? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilwoman Cataldi? Aye. All right. Moving right along. Um, Charlie... Is this an appropriate uh, use of the term nunk pro tunk on this next one? Because the school resource officer has been there? Um, well, the, the contract, which has basically been the same template contract for the last couple of years, right. um, was signed off on last week because the school had a board meeting, a school right. board meeting, and they wanted to see that in good faith that uh, that we were signing it. Uh, now, because there was no changes, because you looked it over, correct, and it is... It's basically the same except for the dates, the same contract. Right. 
So uh, we felt as though it wasn't worth holding a special board meeting to basically do kind of a housekeeping item. So we're doing the resolution, uh, proposed resolution for the town supervisor to sign that contract for school resource officer uh, tonight. Um, and we will write into the contract, I guess, the non -pro well, You're going to say non pro tonk retroactive, yes, right. yeah, both. Right. So any questions from the board members or anybody about that? My question is, is, is this for both school resource officers? So I, I think we might want to explain to those who haven't heard it before that the school resource officers work within the school district during the school year. But when school is no longer in when school is no longer in session, Councilman Dean's telling me I have to speak louder. Sorry. When school is not in session, they are out doing road patrol. Correct. Now I will say, and I don't want to belabor the point here is that uh, uh, Superintendent Kamina I had asked, you know, can we can we just kick this can down the road until we have a regular board meeting on July 16th and we can get it over to you the 17th and he said the next time their meeting is a school board is not until early or mid-August so that's where I said can we, yes. can we do this and uh, you know, like I said um, <laughs> not for anything uh, a lot of contracts that we talk about doing resolutions on are the town spending the taxpayers' money. And uh, there is a reason why you will uh, cross your T's and dot your I's and try to do things in a proper sequential manner. You always try to do that. This is one where actually the town is getting money from the school district. Uh, it's, it's revenue, if you want to call it, coming to us uh, as a town um, for having our police officers uh, be over there. Covering the cost and the benefits of two of our officers for approximately nine months. Right. And the other the other three months that they're not working at the school, they're out on road patrol, uh, traffic traffic right. control. Yeah. The last during couple during of the fun. COVID, they, have they been doing road patrol? They're not at the school, I would take it, since the schools were shut down. Right? Well, they've been on road patrol... I, I'm not sure if they were at the school or not. I, from what I understand, they they have been on the school payroll just recently. They have. <laughs> well, I love it. Uh, look, um, I, uh, the best way I can explain this, I guess, is that the you know the town and the town board. You know, we when we had to approach COVID in the way we had to approach COVID and protect. Our tax basis, the real estate taxes that the town citizens were giving, paying to the town as we looked at different expenses such as payroll to our staff. And I think with our staff, we really tried to uh, set a bar that uh, if you're not working, you're not getting paid. We were able to use that philosophy to get a lot of our people working from their house and get productivity. Now, this board is responsible for the town taxes, not the school board and the school taxes. Now, the contract with the school is that we were getting, the town was getting this money for these resource officers, okay? I have not really talked to the school or the school board about their decision making when COVID all of a sudden sent all the kids home from school and also the teachers. That's not my business. I don't know if the teachers were doing uh, uh, remote classes and they were maybe working harder than when they're in the school room. I do know they were getting paid. Right. That's from the school budget. Right. Well, the school budget paid for our resource officers. Okay. That's that's all I, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that, we were in the contract. You know, our contract been, doesn't say anything about... at the school's disposal. Pardon? That's correct. They would have been at the school's disposal. That's right. Right. Thank you. I just didn't know Thank if anybody you. knew if they were over there or not. I, I, I would suggest, I, I, I do know they were doing, re teachers were doing remote classes. Children were, were distance learning. Mm -hmm. um, given the scope of the school resource officers, 
I'm sure they were at the school's disposal, and they don't necessarily have to be in the building to right. do what they do with students and different issues that come up. So I would, I would suspect that they were still having contact with some students who may have need for a school resource officer. It's a win-win for both. No, I was just an innocent question. Yep. And following that, I will move that the town supervisor sign a contract for the school resource officer. Yep. Second. Uh, Councilman Dean? Aye. Councilwoman Cataldi? Aye. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Aye. That was resource officer, not resource. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, I got to tell you, uh, this one is a pretty easy resolution to read, but I think, uh, and I don't know, if, uh, Joe, if you're the, uh, best suited to explain where we've been at uh, on this process and what we're trying to do as a town uh, on the ash tree, uh, the dead tree issue. All right, well, in the last couple months, the ash trees have become a, a, a huge problem um, in town. They're popping up um, by the hundreds. Um, it's nothing to get into a subdivision and find the skyline completely abandoned uh, as far as the leaves and the trees, and they're dying very quickly within a couple of months. Typically, it's a two to three or four year uh, death, but uh, as of late, with the dry, it just exa uh, you know, accelerated the, the dying. So it's become a, a huge issue uh, with the, in the town, and then there's so many variables within the scope of this. Um, you've got conservation easements, drainage easements, town lands, town park districts, uh, right of way. Uh, there's a lot of variables. So um, Josh and Karen, myself, and Tom pretty much came up with a policy, which uh, I think is fair and equitable across the board as far as responsibility, not only from the town's aspect, but from homeowners to put something out on our website that everybody can see and view and at least uh, know where they stand with the trees. Um, it's not so much the trees dying, but they're becoming very vulnerable because the woodpeckers, in a matter of months, are annihilating the trees 20, 30 feet, uh, 40 feet off the ground, making the entire canopy vulnerable. Um, for those that out there that are watching, um, or anybody that understands the ash trees, these ash trees can be 30 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet, and it's the big ones um, that are the most vulnerable. Uh, they've, you know, they're two, three feet in diameter at the base, 90 foot tall, and when they've got a 100-foot wide canopy at the head and it's compromised halfway up, it becomes a liability and a very dangerous situation. So we're putting together a package um, so that the, the trees that are the town's, town's responsibility uh, and or the park districts where it's a, a, you know, a chargeback item, uh, we can at least get the best price for doing this rather than uh, writing on a, a county contract. Um, we're going to put together a bid package and then solicit uh, services so those that are compromised and are a liability to the town and our responsibility that we'll take care of. Is this countywide? Oh, it's it's yeah. statewide. statewide. It's huge. Yeah. And it's, have you talked to other guys? <clears throat> you so, down? yeah, any other towns, absolutely. And it's uh, funny because it seems to have been harder on the west a year ago or two years ago and pushing its way to the east. Um, the problem is by the time you look at the tree, and it's very easy to see the tree, it's got like orange spots on it. It looks like a leper almost, and that's the beetles. Once the beetles are in there, it's, I mean, the beetles are in there by the thousands on each tree. It's amazing how fast they're in there, and the tree will go from somewhat healthy to dead in a matter of two months. But it's pushing its way east, and I don't know if that's with prevailing winds or I'm not positive uh, or an expert on how they move. I remember when, it, when this first arrived? A couple, three years ago, four years they ago. They said in a, in a short period of time there would be no ash trees Okay. Yeah, and, and the sad part is, and we've run this a couple times where there's actually companies out there that are inoculating the trees and trying to save them, but um, in our opinion and based on history, it's a feeble attempt right. uh, because yeah. you, if you, once it starts pushing through, nothing you, nothing you can do is going to stop this thing from moving. So the best thing we do is be proactive and, <clears throat> and hit it head on with a, an approach. Well, and, and Joe, to your point of proactive, and I'm going to hand the baton back to me on this one because... Uh, I just was kind of shocked when, when I was first approached on this thing. I said, well, what is the science of uh, making sure that the ash borers don't kill trees? They don't have it. There isn't one. There isn't one, which kind of surprised me, but they, it is what it is. You said they can inoculate them and prolong the in inevitable. The inevitable, right. So that, you know, was our first fact looking into how we're going to handle this. The second one is, let's face it, until May in Rochester, all trees looked dead. We, we bloom late, and once they bloomed, that's when all of a sudden 
we saw the results of what has happened, you know, since the fall. Joe, you went out, uh, and, and I know Nick Mooney's been on this. Josh, you've been on this. I mean, there's been a lot of deployment of town employees out there really trying to assess how many of these trees, and you think it might be over a thousand. You, you pull into, I could name three subjects right now. You put in, pull in, and the perimeter is all ash trees. The skyline is, is bare. And what used to be a solid canopy is now completely bare. It's sad. Yeah. And, and then, you know, it, it's funny because I guess <laughs> nah, it's not funny at all. Um, as citizens started calling in, emailing in to us, uh, in town about, hey, this tree is dead, it's big, it's hanging over my house. Uh, having been the son of an insurance agent, and we talked about this also, Paul, with uh, our insurance agent here in Webster a couple weeks ago, he confirmed, our insurance agent confirmed what I already knew. That's tantamount to being on notice. We were, when the citizen shows us that the tree is a problem, if that tree falls and destroys their house, we're not insured as the town. If that tree falls and hurts somebody, or worse yet, kills somebody, we're not insured. <clears throat> How much would that cost be to the town if something like that happened? It's almost immeasurable. I say that because the immense number of these trees, as Joe and, and uh, Josh and the crew has gone around, and they're trying to really figure out, okay, hey, look, that, that's on your property, homeowner. That's, that's not our business. That's your property. You've got to take care of it. But this is our property, or a right-of-way, or a a park district, that's on us. And we got to take it down. Um, so within that, and the reason why we're doing this resolution, it would be easy to just go to the, the tree firm that has the county contract. We can, uh, we can piggyback onto that and we don't have to go through a bid process. The problem is, I think that tree contract is more for one here, two here, you know, this and that. And we're thinking that we, if we put this out to bid and give a really good bid of here are the 460 trees we're looking to take down and where they are and where we want them cut down at, whether it's, you know, at the canopy or whether it's right down to the ground. We really believe that we're going to save a lot of money than having the county contract just piggyback onto that. Um, so what the plan is is that the ones that are the most imminent, that these things are literally leaning over and ready to fall on someone's house and they're on our land, we're going to use the county contract then and we're going to do them now. If we get into this bid process um, that starts on July 29th for this, you know, hopefully within a couple of weeks we'll be able to have Dolly open up the sealed bids and we'll figure out which of these three places is the lowest. The, the ones that the bid will be on are not the most imminent, but they still are a danger point. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a subjective thing. We're not going to cut down 1,000 trees. We know that. Um, and I'll give you an example. A tree that we wouldn't cut down is if there's an ash tree that's in the middle of a forest that's eight trees in from the edge. What happens when that tree falls? It's going to lean against another tree. It's not going to hit anything. Um, so that's a kind of a the analysis we're trying to do. You're going to be talking because, about in a conservation easement or in a uh, park district well, for that, right? No, the park, district, really have the any park district is park district is ours. We got to cut those trees down. The park district, Paul, will be charged back what yeah. the cost of that was. Right. Conservation easement is on someone's property. Okay. We're not taking that tree down that. in this, okay? I'm just wondering where um, there would be a forest that, would, that we would be dealing with. Maybe I shouldn't have used it. <laughs> Let me just say this. This isn't in the budget. Oh, no. So, you know, there's never a good time to have something like this that could cost up to six figures. And we're trying to manage it, balancing what it's going to cost and also the, the, the risk. Um, like I said, you know, you sit there and say, oh, my goodness, you know, if it's $100,000 to do this uh, that's not in the budget, wow. However, like I just said to you at the beginning, if one falls on a house, mm -hmm. it's going to be more than $100,000. So, uh, you know, it's just kind of one of those things that, uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's not a great situation to be in. But what I've been very proud of, to tell you the truth, 
uh, the team, you know, Joe and the DPW guys and gals and, and Karen, uh, I mean, you want to talk about in, the, in a very short period of time coming together, writing policy, getting stuff out there, promoting it, this and that. I mean, you know, government, unfortunately, work, goes a little slower at times than private industry. This effort was like private industry. I think it was a, it was a real <laughs> feather in our cap as a town and how the employees really came together and came up with a good plan. So anyway, that right. might have been TMI for the board members if anybody has any questions on this because... Uh, no, but I did see the social media piece that was put out explaining the different scenarios of where a tree might be and whose responsibility it is and I just think that uh, it was really well done. Well, who do you think wrote that? I would think it Thanks, might Josh. be... <laughs> It She's going to come out of that room. Josh, yeah. or maybe the woman. <laughs> <in> the <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Karen. Yeah, it was, it was really good. Yeah, she did a great job. And I mean, it was, like I said, it, 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 it came together really quick. So. And I, I, I did not go to look, but I'm sure it's on our website as well. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, and the citizens are, it's robust. They're, they're calling in, they're emailing in, they're filling out the Submitting forms. forms. Um, so they're. And depending on where it lies, we've got it broken up between different entities so that it, uh, it, nothing gets lost in the mix. Yeah. So, unless Bill or Barry or Patty or John have any other questions or comments on this one? I do not. Um, I uh, propose a resolution to solicit bids for the removal of ash trees in the town of Webster to be advertised as of July 29th, 2020. Second. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilman Dean? Aye. Councilman Aye. Abbott? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilman Cataldi? Aye. When will the bids be open? <laughs> I think the way we had it was that it was going to be open for two or two weeks. <coughs> um, is that, that is a Wednesday the 29th. Is that what it was? Okay. Uh, We're advertised on the 29th. 29th. Um, and as you know, Barry, there's only a certain number of companies in town that could do something like this. You know, it's not your, your guy or gal out of the back of their pickup or the truck. I mean, hundreds are going to be in the bid. The biggest thing we got right now is that between now and the 29th, I told Joe and the guy, you, you, to, to have that bid be solid, we have to have the inventory really specific so these places can go out and Take a look at what they're. Yeah, you know, but when we bid. when we advertise, but we have to have an weeks. opening date. Don't yeah, don't I we? It was if it's two weeks, it is the twelfth of August. Yeah, I, I could have sworn that that's what. Joe, do you have an inventory of the ash trees? Not currently, no. It's growing by the day. So, but Josh and I talked extensively today about the bid specs and how we'd have to quanti you know put something to quantify on here and and so that the bids are apple to apple. Okay. Barry, would you, I mean, I had it as, as two weeks. <clears throat> Do you think it should be longer, shorter? Two weeks should be enough. Okay. For, bid, for companies I, to bid on it, I as long as they have yeah. the, the document. Yeah, I think it would be back in this boardroom on Thursday the 20th, because we as a board would have to accept right. a bid. So you open on the 16th and award on the 20th? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, is that right? It's Thursday the 12th. Well, it's two weeks. Yeah. Okay. We could award at the workshop. We could. I mean, it depends if these guys say the, the 12th. 13th. 13th, yeah. Uh, is it 13th? It's a day to review. You know. 13th is the workshop. Yeah. yeah. That's the day you want to open them? No, I want to open them on Wednesday the 12th. And, oh. uh, yeah, okay. Well, that's a good point, here. Bill. I mean, I, I know we usually don't do resolutions well, how fast we have to get in to start cutting them down. That's the question. Well, yeah, we could use the county contract for those that are. We've got a few that are ready to fall on a house. I would suggest we use the county contract and get. That's what they and said. That's what we're doing. Do. Yeah. When, they, when they're doing the inventory, and it's and this is, it's a bit subjective. They they have to assess this. We're going to the county contract and saying get out there and cut it down yesterday. But the ones that aren't as imminent. They're going to go into this bid, and then there's going to be ones that we just keep out of the bid because I, you know, 
if, he, if Joe's right that there's a thousand trees. Is this going to be a turnkey operation, or are we going to supplement the efforts? I, it's probably going to be so. I, I don't think that we would have the resources to do that um, to aid Complete. ourselves. Yeah, but again, the operation could be different depending. That's what we're Josh and I were talking about as far as the variables in this, depending on location, compromise, width of canopy, height. Those variables are all going to change as to whether we just remove the canopy and remove the liability, or do we take it to the ground depending on location. This is going to be one of the hardest specs to write based on it's not like a you're doing an addition where it's you know it's it's uh, very black and white. This is this is going to be a tough bid spec to write. Yeah. So we, there's a lot of variables out there. So we got to we got to make sure that we cover our bases and that the uh, bid spec is um, enough where uh, those bidding on it they can see it and read it and it's apple to apple. I can understand. I can understand you wanting to allow yourself to bid out just cutting off the tops, the canopies, off the trees. That would be, would expedite the whole deal. But in doing so, you're going to leave yourself a lot of trees that the residents are then are going to be calling you to take down yourself. Again, it depends on location too. I mean, if it's in the middle of the woods, so be it. If it's park district, as long as the threat is removed, that's all our obligation. Okay. So yeah. So there, again, there's the right of way easements. Um, there's a lot of variables. So yeah. that's why it's going to be a tricky one to write. Because I know in the past we've had trees go down, <coughs> big trees in, in park districts that are leaning on other trees, and the residents have called us to have them removed because they felt that they were a danger. Chances are these ash trees that are vertical. It, hypothetically, say we leave it 25 in the air, it's not going to it's not going to fall right away. Okay. The ash way it's going to become fo a food source for a lot of wildlife. Okay. It's a tough one because, I mean, to your yeah. point, if you do the canopy, it's cheaper. But if you know in a couple of years you've left 40 feet, and when that 40 feet falls down, 10 of it's on someone's land. Well, and it's going to be not just a danger. It's yeah. going to be unsightly, and residents are going to right. call in that. Exactly. So, I mean, we you really, you really got to balance this. And, I mean, I, um, hopefully, Joe and... Uh, Could you do some type of spec that would allow one of the town employees to be with the crew to go out and identify the trees and direct them as to what they want done, what you want done on that tree? Yeah, we had, we had talked about that because we need, I don't want to say to protect our investment, to make sure though that it doesn't get twisted sideways by either lack of communication or a homeowner's influence, which has happened. So that's... Well, I, and as I've said, you know, the, the homeowner's influence, uh, I've been told that when we do one tree at a time through the county contract and the town says, hey, go out for, you know, 800 bucks and cut down this tree, that there's been situations where the homeowner said, hey, you know, I talked to the town, while you're out here, cut down this one, cut down this hmm. one, cut down this one, and we get a bill for $5,000. That's a that's a problem, Yeah, that, right? That doesn't that's not going to happen once no. we get a bid, because if we accept a bid, that company knows that they said that they were going to do that scope of work that's in the bid. I don't want to hear boo about them sending us a, bi uh, a bill for more than that, saying, oh, well, why we were out there, the Homer, the Homer said what? No, that, that That's not going to happen no. in this thing. But as far as the specificity, uh, when they do start cutting them down, I think we will probably have to go in and inspect what we expect. Um, because the last thing you want is if we have a couple of ones that we're like, you got to get that right down to the ground, and then they go out there and just do the canopy and think that they're going to still bill us for the whole bit. So we, we would have to have some type of, you know, protect uh, our investment inspection, especially on the ones where we're expecting it to go down to the ground. So it uh, should be a fun process. But uh, like I said, we'll, we'll probably be back in front of you guys and gals on the 13th or the 20th with the bids. And there might be some more... <coughs> Um, information at that point about just how many trees well, okay, would, you, know, well you realize you know, this was kind of yeah. just a supplement because the lake level is quieted down it, it offered a new void for something else to come in yeah yeah yeah, yeah good point I guess you know that's uh, no, you make me feel better Joe that, you know, that's, that's great you know, it's, uh, the rainbow yeah it's a, it's a great year to have you know these trees die and us have to pay for cutting them down it could be a better year than that right Alrighty, let's move on to the tabled items from the last board meeting. And the first one um, 
is a resolution to enter into the bid process for the repairs and upgrades to take place at the Clem Road and Fawnwood pump stations. Um, now, I know the board has probably heard more than they'd like to hear over the last couple of months at various <coughs> meetings on these two pump stations, but uh, Charlie, how much of this bid resolution um, I mean I, I can I can read the whole thing um, unless you know it's not that long so the town of Webster Clem Road pump station and following pump station improvements sealed separate bids for the construction of the town of Webster Clem Road pump station and following pump station improvements Addressed to the town clerk, town of Webster, will be received by the town of Webster for the aforementioned project. Return and sealed bids to the town clerk uh, until 11 a.m. local time on August 11th, at which time the bids received will be publicly open and read. Uh, bids received after that specified time will not be considered. The project consists of improvements to existing town of Webster Clem Road pump station, including replacement of three submersible pumps, piping, and Appurtenances, variable frequency drives, associated electrical equipment and heating ventilation system improvements, and Fawnwood Pump Road Station piping system repairs there. Bids are invited for the following work. A, contract number 1A, general construction, Clem Road and Fawnwood Pump Road Stations. B, contract number 1B, mechanical construction, I'm sorry, electrical construction, Clem Road Pump Station only. Con uh, C, contract number 1C, mechanical construction for the Clem Road pump station only. Bidders at their option may submit a separate and independent bid for any or all separate schedules contemplated under this advertisement for bids. All segments will be awarded separately per the division of the work described herein. Bid alternates may include as deemed in the owner's best interest. The issuing office for the bidding documents is Barton and Lejudis Engineers. Um, at their address sets of bidding documents may be viewed and ordered online by registering with the issuing office at the uh, Barton LeJudis website. The following registration complete set of bidding documents may be downloaded. Um, the following plan room services have received sets of bidding documents for work contemplated here in. Syracuse Builders Exchange, Builders Exchange of Rochester, Construction Exchange of Buffalo and Western New York. Each bid must be submitted on the prescribed bid form and accompanied by bid security as prescribed. <coughs> the successful bidder will require to furnish the additional bonds prescribed in the bidding documents in order to perform the public work. The successful bidder and subcontractors prior to contract award shall hold or obtain such licenses as are required by the state statutes and federal and local laws and regulations. Bids will not be accepted from bidders that have been barred from competing on public works under General Municipal Law 5A-103-B. Purchases by the Town of Webster are not subject to any federal, state, or local sales tax. Bidders shall not include in their bid sales and, and compensating use taxes on the cost of materials. Exemption certificates will be executed upon request. For information concerning the pros, proposed work, contact uh, Barton and Judas. A voluntary pre-bid site visit will be held at 10 a.m. Wednesday, August 1st at the Town of Webster Clem Road Pump Station located at 767 Barnes. Lane, Webster, New York, refer to instructions to bidders for further information. Uh, the town of Webster reserves the right to reject all bids or any bid not conforming to the intended purposes of the bidding documents. Second. Second. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Aye. Councilwoman Cataldi? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilman Dean? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Okay, last item on the agenda for the night was tabled uh, two weeks ago, and I'm actually going to look for uh, Attorney Genesi's um, guidance on this, because uh, going back to what I said earlier about usually government moves a little bit slower than private industry, um, the, well, let's put it this way, the intermissible agreement between the town and the village has gone back and forth between the town attorney and the village attorney with them having given the most recent version. Correct. If that version is acceptable, 
which I think it is. Um, but of course, I lean on you, Charlie, more for the well, acceptability. I, I, than I went through it. Um, I accepted a number of the changes. They changed uh, abandonment to decommissioning. There were a few word changes. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the specific was request was to make town lead agent for Seeger, which I think we would have been anyway. Right. Uh, that's that's not a problem. The uh, the total amount of the grant uh, is was already set forth. It's been set forth at five oh five hundred and one thousand uh, dollars. The uh, village share and uh, is estimated to be ten thousand three seventy one. Um, I think they just wanted it to, to be sure that whatever, if it's if less is spent, they didn't want to have to spend more than the five, than right. five percent of what was spent. Uh, I asked uh, that uh, Kim to make sure that the town board members had a copy of what I received from the right. uh, village attorney with the comments, a couple of the comments anyway, by himself and by uh, uh, Mr. Swingley. So. They're, they are there. Hopefully, you've had a chance to take a look at it. It's highlighted here. There's not a lot of changes from uh, my particular, from the document I presented to them. This document is a basis for an intermunicipal contract. It's a memo of understanding, but it, effectively, it will be our contract. Yeah, and I just want to make, I mean, when we tabled this last week, there was actually two components of the, uh, the resolution. One is authorizing the board authorizing the supervisor to sign the municipal agreement. The second thing is the resolution approved the funding of this project. But the funding of the project, and Paul, you as our finance director, would be better to corroborate this, spawns off of what is in the intermissible agreement. And if, if they negotiated, if they came back and changed the dollar numbers in there, which they didn't, that would have changed what we would be voting on as the funding. Right. That's the way I understood it. So when I went through the changes they proposed, and you're right, some of it was just linguistics and whatever, but I didn't see any change to the dollars and all that. So we have integrity of uh, what the, the, the funding was going to be on this project. Is that how you see it, Paul? Uh, correct. Estimate of what the project is going to cost is actually more than what the state originally estimated. So, <clears throat> both what the town, the town share, and the village share is going to be more than the five percent. It's going to be the five percent plus whatever the excess is. Right. Right. I think it's in it's in there that the, yeah. the total estimated cost is five forty six twenty, right. and the grant and is five hundred one. The grant is five hundred one. So, the, so <laughs> there is a difference of, of forty five thousand yeah. dollars. Right, but I mean, there's that grant is uh, not equally split between the town and the village. It articulates in there how much was going to be the village's, uh, you know, portion of that uh, forty-six thousand. How much was going to be the town? Uh, they wanted it based on on the engineer's estimate. So we actually have projected costs and a projected estimate in this agreement. Yeah. I just want to make sure that the board understands what we're voting on um, as far as what funds are estimated that will be over and above what we're getting as a grant. I've got a question for the finance director. Uh, Paul, I had put in there that we requested a bond. That's because I put that in my pretty, pretty much standard agreements, and they, right. they, they, they objected to that, saying that they're good for it. But right. Do you think it's necessary to have a bond? Well, I mean, probably not. I mean, the, the actual portion that they're going to pay us is relatively small in relation to the total cost of the project. <clears throat> I mean, it's always good to have a cash bond, but mm -hmm. we're probably talking about $20,000 altogether. Well, I leave I mean, that this up to the town board be, if you yeah, I mean, want nice to require it or not. It would be I'm nice if they provide the funds. Because I know we had agreed that it, it was going to be in there, and I didn't know so it was in there. what happened. And they there. asked that it be removed. Yeah. Well, they, like, they, let's put it this way. They, I mean, the comment is, is a performance bond and or a letter of credit really necessary? Well, 
Well, the discussion we'll have on this, I guess, depends on, Bill, how much water you got left in your cup. Not a lot. Okay. Well, in layman terms, on one hand, uh, on one end of the spectrum, it, it's, our, it's our brethren, our sisters, our you know, a, a, a government, the village that we should have a very good working relationship with. It's a minor amount of money. I mean, you know, I say minor amount of money. Twenty thousand dollars is nothing to sneeze at. So, in good faith, we could decide as a board that, yeah, we're not going to ask them for a bond. They're good for the money. On the other end of the spectrum, um, you know. Well, if they don't pay, then we're we're stuck. Thank you, Chair. Going after them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's. I. Got my, my was a little mm -hmm. tongue tied to say what what is the obvious. Right. Um, you know, I. Uh, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Okay. It's twenty thousand. If it was, you know. Is it twenty thousand or twenty eight thousand? Twenty eight. That was twenty eight thousand. It's, it's under thirty thousand. It's under thirty thousand. Yeah. It's twenty nine thousand. Right. Right. Correct. If they don't pass, we'll have to go to court and get it. Let it. Trust. <laughs> I love the way Bill gets to the point. You know that. I really could learn a lot from him. Anyway. Um, okay. Okay. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave that out then. That will yes, not be part of it. As long as, and that's, uh, um, that's good that we, we, we discussed today about the intermunicipal agreement because where this resolution doesn't really have to do specifically with it, like I said, the dollar amount spawn, what we're, what we're voting on tonight is spawning off that intermunicipal agreement. So, I'm glad we talked about that. Well, then I make the resolution to approve the funding of the town share of the Ready Project uh, MO65. Second. Supervisor Flaherty? Aye. Councilman Cahill? Aye. Councilwoman Cataldi? Aye. Councilman Abbott? Aye. Councilman Dean? Aye. Right, now, I ask the, uh, the supervisor, do you wish me then to get the quote-unquote revised MOU to the village attorney. Sure. Okay. Yep. And I'll, then, do, I'll uh, do that tomorrow. Yeah. I'm, I'm meeting with the mayor tomorrow at 830. Oh. That won't be the time that we'll be both signing. You know, I, I'd like to because I've been meeting with him a lot as a, as a patty uh, in the deputy meet, uh, mayor that it would be nice in one of those meetings to just bring it two copies and <laughs> sure. we both sign it and there is no who signed first, who signed second. We just both do it at the same right. time. So I think there's an opportunity for that. But if we uh, if we expect it to happen in the morning, then the village attorney will not have seen it before no, they sign it. It, it. it won't happen tomorrow. Okay. No, but I have a sneaky suspicion we might have some more meetings uh, with the mayor and the deputy mayor in the next couple of weeks. Now we'll see about that. No, I. Uh, and John, I hope you know, we were at the end of the meeting, and all of a sudden you started talking. I got. I was like, oh no. <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> no freewheeling discussion. No, no, okay, that's right. <laughs> All right. It's about time that I know I make you nervous. You're just giving me a dose of my own medicine, right? I mean, so um, it is 8:15 right now. Um, I, I don't know if Karen is now putting across the bottom of the screen. Uh, for people watching on uh, Spectrum or live streaming at 872-7011 is for the public to call in. Um, and as we wait to see if any calls are coming in, we'll do our round table of uh, the board members to see if anybody has anything they want to say or ask or whatever. So, uh, okay. I don't have anything to add. Can we talk about the ash trees more, please? <laughs> what would you like to talk about? Uh, uh, I don't know. I think you left something out a little bit. You one of those beetle boars? Yeah. How many years ago did they start coming in New York State? Four, four, four or five, five years ago. I thought it was started. more than that for yeah. some reason. Hey, that's, really when, that's when they put a ban on fire with the ash trees. Yeah. Moving it. Right, but they were in there before that, though, I thought. I think it's about the line, but who knows? Yeah. I think it was another tree and another borer. Another borer? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Now we're done with Jen.
Uh, Bill? I'd like to wish Charlie a happy birthday. No. Get out of here. Oh, Charlie! Happy birthday! 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 to you. Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate I, I, it. I we're going to do how old are you now? Uh, uh, Barry! No, I really don't. I really don't have anything to add tonight. Okay. I um, thought I thought your article... I do have something to add. Oh, right. Your, I, your article today in the Webster Herald did shine some light on what residents have been complaining about, the inaction of the non-arrest of the vehicular accident yeah. on Empire Boulevard. And I thought that uh, your, your article today explained why it's taken so long. Thanks, Barry. Because, I mean, that's, you know, and, and it's funny, I, I, I find that writing an article once a week is, is it's kind of challenging to come up with what topic do you do. I should probably sit down and come up with, like, four topics for the next four weeks. But, um... I didn't. I really did not know how timely that was going to be. That uh, Chief Rieger and the crew did their uh, um, press conference on. I think it was Tuesday, right? And, uh, I did not know that when I wrote that article. So well, it worked out very stated well. That what it used to be was arrest and investigation. Now it has to be full yeah. investigation before the arrest because yeah. of the timeliness of the present the presentation of the materials afterwards. All right. And, uh, you know, Charlie, I, <laughs> you would be best to, to, you know, comment on some of those law changes as of January 1st um, that, that I wrote in that article. But, I mean, uh, I, well, I think a lot of laws, and I said it in there, it's, it's well-intentioned, but there's unintended consequences. And I, I hope... That they, the state assembly and the and the uh, senate and the governor, are not so tied to their decision making that they will ease up and kind of reform the reforms. One would hope. I mean, yeah. Well, thanks, Barry. Um. Well, I think uh, this means that nobody wants to call us tonight, so we always end with. Well, Dolly, as a town clerk, what do you have to announce to anything happening to the town that uh, the citizens should know about? Um, we're still issuing marriage licenses, dog licenses. The office is very busy. And we've finished all the coding on the uh, for the school tax bills and getting everything ready for September 1st, and I think we're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you this uh, before we tie this all up is that at least in the first couple of weeks since I've gotten a chance to work with Dolly, I think uh, the board...